Hello, AMSSM. My name is Dr. Giselle Arney. I'm a member of the Publications Committee, and today in this video, I'm going to walk you through the Agree To instrument. The Agree To instrument is, stands for the Appraisal of Guidelines for Research and Evaluation. It is the second version. There's been multiple. The most recent updated version is from 2017. The purpose of this instrument is to provide a framework to first assess the quality of clinical practice guidelines, but it also can be used prospectively to provide a methodological strategy for the development of future guidelines and inform what information and how that information ought to be reported in the clinical guidelines. For AMSSM, for our purposes, we use the agreed to instrument in order to evaluate other organizations, position statements or guidelines for endorsement. So if another organization, say ACSM or AOSSM comes to us and says, hey, AMSSM would really like your stamp of approval on our clinical practice guideline. The agree to instrument is what we use to evaluate their guideline and help us determine whether we want to endorse it or not. So I'm going to walk you through that today. Give you a little introduction to it but what i first want to point you out to is the agreetrust.org this is a free tool so agree is willing to help train people on how to use this you can download a checklist you can download the user manual you can find everything you need um, at agreetrust.org so keep this in mind um, and feel free to reference it at all times so what i'm going to walk us through is the main sort of outline of this instrument, it's a 23 item instrument and it's split up into six domains. So I'll walk us through these. I'm not gonna go step by step through every single possible question, but I wanna give you an overview of really what does this look like. When doing the review, it's recommended to have at least two reviewers, but preferably four. It's been validated for two to four. Um, and so we would recommend to at least have four different reviewers when doing uh, working through this process there's going to be 23 items for each item it, it's essentially a question and there's a seven point likert scale whether you strongly disagree to strongly agree so here's an example from the user manual for the first um, item so within domain number one which is scope and purpose the first item is the overall objective of the guideline is specifically described. And so then what the user manual will provide for you is a little more information about what does this mean. So the user manual description says this deals with the potential health impact of a guideline on society and populations of patients or individuals. The overall objective of the guideline should be described in detail and the expected health benefits from the guideline should be specific to the clinical problem or health topic. And then it gives you some examples. It also gives you a hint of where to look within the guideline for this information. So for this particular item, it says examine the opening paragraphs or chapters for a description of the scope and purpose of the guidelines. It also gives you the criteria. So when you're rating it, the specific criteria included for this particular item is health intent. So is this a prevention? Is this a screening? Is this a diagnosis, a treatment? What is our health intent with this guideline? What is the expected benefit or outcome? And what is the target? Is it a population, society? You know, who are we targeting with this uh, scope and purpose? And it gives you some additional considerations. And I'll be honest with you, every single um, additional consideration for every single item includes, is the item well-written? <laughs> are the descriptions clear and concise? And is it easy to find in the guideline? For some of the different items of this 23 kind of bullet point list, sometimes it'll have additional considerations that are particular to that topic. So that's still important to think about. It might not necessarily change whether it meets the criteria, but it's still something worth considering when you're doing your grading. So I'm gonna walk us through these different domains to give you a little bit of information. Again, I'm not gonna get into that very specific thing for each of these items because the user manual is easily accessible and it's free and you can get it yourself. I will leave that up to you, but I'll walk you through some of these things and what they mean. So domain one relates to scope and purpose of the guideline. So they wanna know that the overall objective of the guideline is specifically described, the health question, is uh, covered by the guideline is specifically described and the population to whom the guideline is meant to apply is again specifically described. So what I also love about 
this agree to framework is I, I could easily see this being used in whether you're teaching fellows or residents about how to evaluate the literature. They do a great job. So again, domain one, scope and purpose. Domain two, stakeholder involvement. They wanna see, does the guideline development group include individuals from all relevant professional groups? If you're talking about a sports medicine physical therapy, do you have physical therapists on your guideline writing group? They also wanna see that the views and preferences of the target population have been sought. So are you involving those women soccer players who have torn their ACL when developing these guidelines? Yes, they might not have the comprehension of the scientific you know, literature background, but we're still involving them in the process when you're creating a guideline. And then lastly for this domain is that the target users of the guideline are clearly defined. Are we targeting coaches? Are we targeting sports medicine physicians? Are we targeting athletic trainers? Has that been clearly defined as to who this guideline applies to? Domain three has the most bullet points and it is about the rigor of development. So they wanna see, did we have systematic methods to search for evidence? Was the criteria for selecting the evidence clearly described? Were the strengths and limitations of the evidence clearly dis described? What were the methods for formulating the recommendations and were those methods clearly described? Have we addressed the health benefits, side effects, and risks um, considered when we're formulating the recommendations? Is there an explicit link between the recommendations and the supporting evidence? Or was there like not enough supporting evidence but we still just went ahead and made a recommendation anyway? Number 13 is the guideline has been externally reviewed by experts prior to its publication. Number 14 is a procedure for updating the guideline is provided. Again, I think this uh, agreed to framework will also be very helpful, not just for our reviewing other organizations position statements, but also when we develop our own, because there's a lot of really important information here. Okay, moving on, domain four. This is when we get into clarity of presentation. So they wanna know that the recommendations are specific and unambiguous, that the different options for management of the condition or health issue are clearly presented, and that key recommendations are easily identifiable. Now, one of the things I'll get to in a minute is that not every single one of these items might be applicable for every single clinical guideline. So maybe there is not different options for management of the condition or health issue presented, because maybe that's not even what we're talking about, right? So 16 might not apply. So when you do your scoring, you're gonna adjust for that. Um, and we'll, again, I'll talk about that in just a moment. All right, domain five, applicability. Is this guideline, um, applicable to its population? Can you describe facilitators and barriers to its application? Does the guideline provide advice or tools on how the recommendations can be put into practice? Does the potential resource implications of applying the recommendations, have that been considered? And then lastly, the guideline presents monitoring and or auditing criteria. Okay, domain six is the last domain. We're hitting our 22, 23 bullet points. From editorial independence, are the views of the funding body influenced, have they influenced the content of the guideline? So who funded putting this together and have they influenced the outcome? And then 23, the last one is, competing interests of guideline development group members have been recorded and addressed. So they're not trying to say you can't have any competing interests, but they're saying they have been clearly identified, they have been recorded, and they have been addressed. So then, the final step, there's two overall assessment questions that are outside of the initial 23 item um, assessment tool. And this is really a gestalt, what is the overall quality of this guideline? And you're doing it on that same seven point Likert scale. What I will say about this is that it is not an average of your previous scores. This is just you after you've done all the other work. When you look back at this guideline, Gestalt, where do you think it rates from a quality perspective? And then number two is, would you recommend this guideline for use? Yes, yes with modifications, or no. So let's get into that scoring. There are six domains, which we just reviewed. Each of those domains are independent. You do not aggregate the domains together. You will not get a final like one number score for the agree to instrument. Instead, you'll end up with six scores for the six domains, and then you'll still have your two sort of final overall thoughts. You're gonna calculate each domain score by scaling the total as a percentage of max possible score. Let me break this down with a little bit of math. 
So if we go back to domain one, if you remember, it had three items. So with that three items, each item has a maximum score of 21 if you add them together, right? Because you go from one to seven. So in the domain with those three items, if you're adding them together, your max score is 21 and your minimum score is three. This is important. Your minimum score is not zero. Your minimum score is three. So we're going to scale for that. If you have four appraisers doing the review, then your max total score is actually 84 because it's the max score of 21 times all four appraisers, which is 84. Your min total score, your minimum is 12, right? Because it's three times four. So you're going to sum of the, you're going to sum the four appraiser scores across all three items. And let's just pretend it's 53. That's what, that's what this domain scored for whatever, you know, fictional clinical guideline we're reviewing. Those four appraisers, when you added their items one to three, all together across all four, 53. So what you're going to do is give that obtained score minus the minimum possible score and divide that by the maximum possible score minus the minimum possible score. That's how we're scaling and that's how we're getting a percentage. So the math is right there. So the final for this particular domain in our hypothetical scenario is 57%. Okay. What we don't have with scoring is a couple things. One is that some items might not be pertinent. I mentioned that before. There is no not applicable score in the agree tool. So really what you have to do is if you decide ahead of time that this particular question is not applicable and not just like it's so poorly done that they didn't do it, like they should have done it and they didn't, but that it's just not actually applicable to this particular guideline, then you can adjust the overall score by removing that item and just adjusting what you, what you would say the total and minimum potential of that domain is overall. Um, another issue is uh, interpreting the domain scores. So the domain scores help you identify the strengths and weaknesses of a guideline. If your guideline has really strong methodology and it's got a pertinent patient population, it's very clear, but maybe they, they didn't write it very well, right? Like that might adjust how you feel about the clinical guideline. Maybe it's actually a really great clinical guideline and it just wasn't worded very well, but you feel like the data is very pertinent and it was put together methodologically sound versus maybe you have a document that has kind of not particularly great methodology. Maybe they didn't really evaluate their primary literature. They didn't tell you the strengths and weaknesses of the literature they included. Then even though they wrote the document with beautiful language and they made it really clear, they didn't do the work. Some of these domains you might decide are more or less important to whether or not you're willing to adopt, utilize, or endorse a particular clinical guideline. And what's also interesting to know is that there are no quality thresholds. So there's been no data to support the link between a specific quality score and an implementation outcome. So just because you score 100% on all six domains, there's been no kind of science to say, well, that means that everybody's going to use this guideline or that it's a great guideline or that it will be implemented well or it'll be implemented broadly versus a guideline that has, you know, a 60% across all the domains. So there's really no way to say that just because this scored a 50 versus a hundred, is this a good or a bad clinical guideline to what level that data doesn't exist. So what that means is that you, the individual or the organization has to kind of set, what do you feel like your priorities are? Which domains do you think are most important? And is there a cutoff that you might feel comfortable with knowing what those scores are, knowing what those domains mean, are there different scores that you might be comfortable with? Some folks, when they'll, when they're doing a scoring, if they think, you know what, domain number three, methodology, that is the most important one. Then they might say, great, let's start there. And if they don't meet the threshold that we're going to set arbitrarily, but we're going to set it for 70%. If this clinical guideline doesn't meet 70%, I'm not even going to bother wasting my time doing the rest of the agree to instrument. Or some people will just walk through it in order and just see what they get and see what things look like. But you kind of implement this on your own. At AMSSM, we do not have specific cutoffs, um, but it is a matter of discussion once the agree to framework has been put together to kind of say, based off of what we're seeing, 
what do we feel like we should implement? What, what do we feel like we should be endorsing? Just a few references here. So again, agreetrust.org, that's where you can find this information. You can find the user manual. There is an agree reporting checklist that gives you just like a quick checklist of, of each item with its criteria. And um, they even have where you can sign up for like an online platform where you and your other uh, like raters can all put your ratings within their like online platform and they will like aggregate the totals for you. So that's another option. So this has just been a quick video to try to walk you through an introduction to the agree to framework. As a reminder with an AMSSM, we use this to determine whether we want to endorse another um, organization's uh, clinical guideline. So you might be asked as a member of the publications committee to review um, an AOSSM clinical guideline and you would be given this framework to work through and this is how you're doing it. You can reference this video and if you need more guidance, go to agreetrust.org for the user manual with all sorts of specific details. Best of luck.